Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Connecticut's Old State House. We're delighted to see you here. Um, my name is Rebecca Tabor Conover. I'm head of public programs, and we're so happy you're joining us for this special program. You may that know that today is an extended two-hour conversation at noon. Usually our programs run about an hour. If you have to leave for any reason to get back to work or anything, please feel free to do so. Um, we are taping this show for um, by the Connecticut Network, so you, if you miss part of it, you can watch it later online or on the, on the network. Today's program is sponsored by Connecticut Humanities, and we're deeply appreciative of their funding for this program. This program is part of their special initiative, which is called Fake News, Is It Real? Journalism in the Age of Social Media, and the Democracy and the Informed Citizen Initiative. These are administered by the Federation of State Humanities Council, and the initiative seeks to deepen the public's knowledge and appreciation of the vital connections between democracy, the humanities, journalism, and an informed citizenry. We thank the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation for their support of this, excuse me, of this initiative and the Pulitzer Prize, Prizes for their partnership. On your seats, you will find a survey. We do ask you to fill those out before you leave, and you can hand them to one of our staff members. Um, we do actually read them and use them with, for ideas for future programs. And we do hope you'll join us for our next conversation at noon. If you can believe it, it will be 2019 when we see you next. Um, on uh, Tuesday, January the 15th, we will have architectural historian Christopher Wiegren here to talk about some of Connecticut's most historic places. It is now my pleasure to introduce my friend and well-known media icon, truly one of Connecticut's treasures, Diane Smith. Diane is a New York Times best-selling author, Emmy award-winning journalist, documentary producer, and speaker. She was on the air in Connecticut for more than 25 years at a variety of networks, including WTNH, CPTV, WTIC News Talk, and the Connecticut Network. Currently, Diane is a distinguished lecturer in communications and media studies at the University of New Haven. Welcome, Diane. Thanks, Rebecca. So an icon, a treasure, and distinguished. This better be good. <laughs> That's setting a very high bar. It's nice to see all of you today. And welcome to our program called Navigating the News. As Rebecca uh, mentioned, this is part of what has been a year-long exploration by Connecticut Humanities called Fake News, Is It Real? And I want to just read you a small bit from the website that they created for this initiative so that you kind of get an idea of the heart of it. And they say, journalism is critical to a healthy democracy. For citizens to make informed decisions, they need reliable news and information. Journalism plays an integral role in this process by improving knowledge, helping build consensus, and holding government officials accountable. But is traditional journalism still relevant in today's era of fake news? So throughout the year, the programs that have gone on around the state in concert with this exploration have tried to answer some of these questions. Why are people distrustful of news? How is technology changing our consumption of information? How can we evaluate news sources? We're going to talk about some of those questions and more today. We have three excellent speakers joining us. The first is going to give us an historical perspective. You may think that fake news or biased news is something we have only recently discovered. Not so. Goes way back. And Barry O'Connell is joining us from Amherst College. He is the James E. Ostendorp Professor of English Emeritus. Professor O'Connell founded the first Head Start in the greater Boston area. His other teaching experiences included elementary and high school in New Haven. In his collegiate teaching, he has sought to widen the understanding of American history and literature by offering courses that included African American, American Indian, Asian American, Latino, Southern, and working class experience and writings. His best known writing is a book length introduction to and complete collection of the writings of William Apis, probably the first American Indian to publish a book on our ground, the complete writings of William Apis, a Pequot. How does this fit into a program on fake news? You're about to find out. Please welcome Professor Barry O'Connell. I move, I hope, more slowly than I speak. <laughs> but I'll try not to speak too fast as well. Um, 
Taking you back almost two centuries to the 1830s may seem hugely irrelevant, but most Americans don't know that the press in American history from the Constitution forward was intensely partisan, nasty beyond almost anything, including Fox News, uh, inventive of scandal whenever necessary to discredit people. So every politician who ran for office had at least two uh, affairs uh, and multiple other things wrong. The idea of an objective press emerges only in the late 19th century and slowly. So I hope we're not going backwards, but you're going to get some examples of that today. So I'm going to start with the questions that inform where I go with this talk and where I end up. Who gets heard in the media? How are they represented? How can we define fair representation? How do we attain media that bring us a full range of American voices? These are my subjects as I take us back to the early 19th century to William Apis, an Indian preacher, a controversial Indian preacher, and then forward to the present. Apis's name is all too little known these days, though he enjoyed some notoriety in his own day, the late 1820s and the 1830s. He was an Indian evangelical preacher, an itinerant who took roots through New England to all the communities of Indians in the New England region. He especially ministered to Indian communities, all of which were impoverished and struggling to survive an almost entirely hostile white world. Most New England Indians had lost their land base by then and therefore had to work as indentured servants and other uh, menial tasks of difficulty. But he also far more riskily preached to whites, braving spit, rotten vegetables, stones, and threats on his life. Most took offense at even the idea of a Christian Indian preacher. Though he was eloquent, he was more than that. He directly and devastatingly named whites racism, their treatment of native peoples and African Americans, and demonstrated White's repeated violation of their own professed Christianity. Until James Baldwin in the 1960s, no American writer, not even W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, invented an address to racism so compelling, so nearly impossible to evade as Apis did. Like many such persons of color in the United States, he might have been forgotten forever, as he was in fact after the 1830s until the late 1970s. Many of his words, his presence survived because he wrote and published five books between 1831 and 1836. The next to last, Indian nullification of the unconstitutional laws of the state of Massachusetts relative to the Mashpee Indians will be my primary text today. The events he reviews and presents there involves what was popularly and by a few historians known as the Mashpee Revolt or riot, depending on your perspective. I want in part to give you a sense of how Apis was portrayed in much of the press regionally and even for a brief time nationally. But I intend then to turn some notions of how we might best conceive the role of the press and media in a vibrant and true democratic society. So before I do, please think with me about, again, who has a voice in our public affairs and who has not. In Apis's time, the answer might be starker even than now. Most African Americans lived utterly silenced in slavery. Most Indians had no voice, especially in the East. The majority of whites, most of whom labored hard in lasting poverty, had little voice. And unsurprisingly, women had no voice. This leaves the small percent of the educated, no more than 5%, the wealthy prosperous, perhaps 5%, and the small number of uh, many of whom were slave owners with large plantations and a small number of highly successful uh, businessmen. The corporate world was only beginning to come into being and in, in fact in Massachusetts. Taken together, these are nowhere near a majority and they ran everything. Even though the property qualifications for voting had been removed in most states, large numbers of people remained at best at the political margins and yet were in fact the real majority. So again, who could speak? Who did speak? And who of those who couldn't, or those who dared, or had the ability, 
could be heard, because speaking is only the beginning. And by whom could they be heard? Please keep these and my other questions in mind as we go forward. Americans who are outside what I call the audible or legitimated political, social, and intellectual world are not heard. That breaking through to being heard is rare and often dangerous and can invite violence because felt as an outrage, a violation of the norms of who is expected to speak. APIS was determined not only to be heard, but to call whites to account so powerfully as to convert them to just action, action grounded in the realization of a common humanity, a rejection of whites' notions of hierarchy, which placed native people below whites and African Americans even lower. Listen now, and you may hear how he made himself heard, may hear how right he was then and now, and how much he violated his hearer's sense of privilege and righteousness. This is from a short piece of his called An Indian's Looking Glass for the White Man. The title itself a kind of outrage then. All of it remains prescient, I think, and worthy of the closest attention. This is Apis. But reader, I acknowledge that this is a confused world, and I am not seeking for office, but merely placing before you the black inconsistencies that you place before me, which is 10 times blacker than any skin that you will find in the universe. And now let me exhort you to do away with that principle, paying attention to blackness, as it appears 10 times worse in the sight of God. And candid men than skins of color more disgraceful than all the skins that Jehovah ever made. If black or red skins or any other skin of color is disgraceful to God, it appears that he has disgraced himself a great deal. For he has made 15 colored people to one white and placed them here upon the earth. Now let me ask you, white man, if it is a disgrace for me to eat, drink, and sleep with the image of God, or sit, or walk, and talk with them, or have you the folly to think that the white man, being one in 15 or 16, are the only beloved images of God? Assemble all the nations together in your imagination, and then let the whites be seated among them, and then let us look for whites, and I doubt it Doubt not it would be hard finding them, for to the rest of the nations they are still but a handful. Now suppose these skins were put together and each skin had its national crimes written upon it. Which skin do you think would have the greatest? I will ask one question more. Can you charge the Indians with robbing a nation almost of their whole continent and murdering their women and children and then depriving the remainder of their lawful rights? that nature and God require them to have. And to cap the climax, rob another nation to till their grounds and welter out their days under the lash with hunger and fatigue under the scorching rays of a burning sun. I should look at all the skins, and I know that when I cast my eye upon that white skin and I saw those crimes written, I should enter my protest against it immediately and cleave to that which is much more honorable. And I can tell you that I am satisfied with the manner of my creation fully, whether others are or not. Imagine that address now. Uh, he's the only person for almost a century who puts together offenses against Indians and blacks. Usually it's one or the other. He's also the only person who speaks internationally that notion about who really peoples the earth is not white people. We are a tiny minority. He continues by reminding his white auditors that Jesus was a person of color, not a white. And then he does a reading of the Gospels in which Christ re uh, repeatedly enjoys all human beings to love one another, including their armed enemies, and then on the Sermon on the Mount specifies the major acts that go with such love. No wonder that Apis was abused, reviled, and scorned. Only Frederick Douglass, a bit later, could match Apis's rhetorical powers. And are we not, as a culture, still indictable in his terms? Indians remain the poorest in the population and largely ne neglected in their poverty. And neither in most of our history books nor in daily life can whites bring ourselves to acknowledge that it was black slave labor and then later blacks as peons 
created much of the wealth that made us the greatest industrial power on the earth. What scant returns have they enjoyed? Return now to Mashpee and Apis's controversial presence there. In 1834, Mashpee was the largest Indian community in southern New England. Though its land resources were substantial, the native people had no control over them. The governor of Massachusetts appointed white overseers with no voice from the Indians in their selection. The overseers had absolute power to lease the lands, always to whites, to allocate its timber and access to its rich fisheries, to indenture children and male adults to labor for others for indefinite terms. As a result, there were almost no males and no children left in Mashpee. Uh, so for example, there were two school buildings on the reserve, <coughs> but no funds to hire teachers. The Mashpees, for well over a century, had petitioned and protested these arrangements, but rarely obtained any hearing. They had a meeting house and a church, but these were controlled by another outside force. Harvard appointed its minister, a man named Phineas Fish. He had served for some 24 years, converting not one Indian, when protest again broke out. His congregation was nearly all whites who came from surrounding towns, not from Mashpee itself. It was a nice church. Most Mashpees attended Baptist services ministered by one of their own, a man named Blind Joe Amos, quite a remarkable man, though they had no church building, so services were often held outdoors when weather permitted, because that was the larger congregation. Fish's offenses were compounded by the fact <laughs> that he claimed as his own about 500 acres of the most desirable land, wood for sale from a prime woodlot, and a house. These all, in fact, violated the state laws about what could go on in Mashpee. That is, only, their lands could only be leased and for short terms, and it was long endorsed by the law, but unenforced. Apis came to Mashpee in 1833 in one of his usual rounds preaching to Indian communities. For only one day, he tells the readers of Indian nullification. That is, he did not come to Mashpee in his own terms to join in this protest. In fact, he was unaware of it, he says, until he got there. One might doubt his claim, given what followed, but we have nothing but his word here. He arrived in the midst of agitation organized for some months by the Mashpees. They were getting no response from the Massachusetts legislature, and their requests were simple. Let us govern ourselves and be full citizens. No more government by overseers or Harvard or alien ministers. Give us control over our church and meeting house, and remind the minister that he owns nothing in Mashpee and is not welcome. Almost immediately, Apis proved indispensable, not simply literate, as only about five of the Mashpees were, but as a skilled rhetorician and tactician. Quickly adopted into the nation, Apis designed a strategy assured to get the attention of the authorities. As a representative of the Mashpee now, he announced that they had the right to nullify the unjust laws applied to them. An extraordinarily radical proposition. Uh, by echoing John C. Calhoun and the South Carolinians, Carolinians' assertion of the same right a mere two years before, which created a national crisis and it was a forecast of the Civil War, Apis elevated the Mashpee situation thus beyond the local by this name. It got immediate national attention. The Mashpees voted in community to remove the state appointed overseers as part of nullifying and so notified them, removed the minister though he stayed in place, and made a true declaration of independence. We are only like our white forebears in doing so. That's an apis sentence, but it's in the petition they all signed. Announcing the intention to enforce their rights, they declared as of the coming July 1st, 1834, that no outsider could remove wood and other valuables from their lands, and that the overseer's oversight was over. Whites. Outsiders, on that very day, deliberately loaded two carts with wood, and Apis and three other Mashpees confronted them, unloaded the carts, and sent them on their way. This was reported in the press as a riot, uh, as the Indians being armed with bows and arrows and guns. No, neither. It was not a riot. Uh, so it was declared a riot, and Apis was the outsider and criminal person provoking and manipulating the naive and innocent, innocent Mashpees, uh, a majority of whom, it was claimed, did not support any of these acts. In fact, everybody but five members of the tribe did, over 100, that is. 
This claim was repeatedly asserted in the press until to many it seemed an unassailable truth. One of the things about the media is if you repeat something long enough, it takes on the aura of truth no matter how untrue. Um, a recognizable tactic of an unprincipled press and in our own time practiced, practiced in critical parts of the media. So per what persuaded that this was true, Levi Lincoln, governor of Massachusetts, kind of a creep, thought to call out the state militia, 10,000 strong, and imagined himself gloriously marching on the Mashpees and, and destroying them in a magnificent battle. They had five rusted muskets in the hole of Mashpee. Wiser heads talked him down, and he soon left office, blessedly. Apis and three Mashpees were indicted for a riot. A rigged jury in the next county produced a conviction and a sentence of 30 days in the Barnstable County Jail. It was reported through the whole land that there were hostile movements, this is Apis speaking, among the Indians at Cape Cod. Get this page to turn. Or Buzzard's Bay. All the editors were very willing, says Apis, to speak on the favorite topic of Indian wrongs, but very few of them said anything about redress. On this head, they were either silent or against us. As Apis predicted to the Mashpees, he was the object of continual attacks in the press. And this is from the Barnstable Patriot, next county again. Uh, at the times of Apis coming among them, they were quiet, peaceable, and their condition mentally, morally, and pecuniarily improving. At this time comes this intruder, this disturber, this riotous and mischief-making Indian. He goes among the Mashpees and by the arts, all the arts of a talented, educated, wily, unprincipled Indian, professing with all to be an apostle of Christianity, he stirs them up to sedition, riot, treason. He was an imposter, quote, a rascal, a conniving savage, a provoker of violence, a vile and degraded. The adjectives actually continue beyond the ones I've given you. His real crime lay in his power with words, a power evident throughout this book about these events. Quote, it seemed to be the common opinion that the imprisonment of Apis would frighten the rest of the tribe and cause them to forego their efforts to rec recover their rights. Had this been the case, they might have carted a few more good suppers and dinners out of our woods and have eaten them on their town meeting days and have thrown the bones and crust of the poor old and ignorant among the natives as they had done year after year. The missionary, as usual, might have helped them devour the spoil. Much was also said about the pains that had been taken to educate the Mashpees, and it was mentioned that instead of going to the schools open for them, they preferred going about the country picking berries and basket making. Let whom who has been prejudiced by such an argument look at the Legislative Act of 1789 prohibiting the instruction of the Mashpees in reading and writing under the pain of death. Who then dared to teach them? Apis's mastery of the state laws is impressive throughout the book and in his activism, but it is his clarity of exposition and his sharp-edged language that reveal his power and the reasons his opponents feared him so. Uh, he addressed the state legislature uh, eventually, uh, and his eloquence persuaded them to change the laws. Um, the highest officials from state government, elevated citizens of high standing and judges, could not silence or intimidate him. A short example, quote, though it is manifest that we have cost the government absolutely much less than nothing, we have been called state paupers and as such treated. Those are strange paupers who maintain themselves and pay large sums to others into the bargain. Hey ho, it's a fine thing to be an Indian. One might as well also as well be a slave. That's Apis addressing these charges. Many of the written statements submitted to the legislature came from Apis. Benjamin Hallett, the Indian's lawyer, was an effective advocate um, his letter is clear, mild, and eloquent, but Apis' hand is clearly behind his writing. The Mashpees won their case and became their own governors. Um, it took longer to get rid of their minister who demeaned them and would only allow into the church those Indians who accepted openly their inferiority. The 20th century brought new miseries, for by the 1970s, their extensive and beautiful lands on Cape Cod, empty to white eyes, to developers and speculators who eventually got control over all of their land. It's now the most heavily built on county uh, or town in on the Cape. Uh, they lost almost all 
The Obama administration brought new hopes by granting their long argue, argued petition for federal recognition. Six months ago, a new president withdrew that recognition. So they are back, in effect, stateless, voiceless, and with no land. So I return to my opening questions. How do we imagine a genuinely democratic press and media? What might they look like? How should they inform us? What responsibility should they have to report comprehensively to the whole population and on the whole population? Currently, we are past being in an information crisis. Our situation is much more perilous. Much of the radio, the newspapers, TV, and other media is in the hands not only of large corporations, but I would argue of entirely reactionary ones. Sinclair, Fox, owners of all the Chicago papers, the Los Angeles papers, in fact, most of the papers in the United States. And what do I mean by this? These are owners who are uninterested in any far-reaching, independent, or fair reporting. They are uh, ideologues with a message or, or state of position about politics, which those who work for them must forward. These are not, to mince words, anything but authoritarian instruments. Helping citizens recognize and think through difficult matters is the opposite of their interests. Newspapers in Apis' times were also commonly but the instruments of their owners and others, but their reach was limited and there were many papers, not so now, and we have social media to con contend with, again owned by a few, their activities and practices neither transparent nor accountable, yet powerfully influential, not simply on the news, but on the very nature of our interactions. Who, even two years ago, would have imagined a president of the United States who would communicate substantially by tweets? Our only chance of reversing or reforming these consolidations of information and influence is sustained democratic action. Change will require many ideas, experiments, and the undermining of information monopolies. A difficult course, but I have hope, for I believe in our citizens' ability to make change and to move towards the better in our affairs. To lose hope is to draw upon ourselves a fierce and terrible darkness, not only for our own being, but for the world itself. This is the largest political and other stake before us today. We must have ways of learning our world we can depend upon. Thank you. Our next speaker is an associate professor of journalism at Quinnipiac University. Rich Hanley worked as a journalist for local, national, and global media for 23 years in print, television, and online before joining Quinnipiac in 2001. He has produced, written, and directed several Emmy-nominated documentaries, both for CPTV and for PBS. Hanley is frequently interviewed by news media on the intersection of politics and technology, appearing in media outlets ranging from the New York Times to Variety Magazine to offer insights into the origins and distribution of disinformation through social media, among other topics. Please welcome my friend, Rich Hanley. Um, thank you, uh, and thank you, Professor, for those. Uh, very cogent remarks and tying it to a historical context. That I, I think we all need to understand that um, that history is a continuum, and you know it, I'm going to actually get into a piece of that. I'm here, so thank you, thank you for that. Um, and I'm gonna, there are four errors in U.S. journalism. I'm going to go a little uh, convergence of technology and journalism to bring us up to the present moment, um, so we'll have the contextual understanding of uh, of where we are and where we've been, and then Adam will talk about where we're going. <laughs> uh, and I'm sure he'll do a great job. You know, so why did I select these, uh, these four errors, distinct errors? Uh, each represents technological change in the post-Civil War uh, piece of American history. And these technological changes influenced uh, news gathering and reporting, and a whole host of other uh, cultural um, elements. Why technology? Uh, well, the velocity and consumption of information 
um, expands greatly during spasms of technological development, uh, leading to new forms of reporting, distribution, storytelling, and most importantly of all, interpreting reality. Uh, if we interpret reality through text, that becomes a reality in our mind. If we interpret reality on a screen, that becomes another reality. And then the two are supposed to work together, but ordinarily don't. Um, and why now? Why am I bringing this point up now? Well, it's because our present era is awash, some would say contaminated, uh, by unprecedented information and flows driven by the latest technological spasm, um, you know, smartphones and social media in particular. I mean, there is a very uh, clear reason why Russia uh, was so influential over a lot of things around the world uh, beginning in 2013 14, as they mastered the art of disinformation on social media because they had practiced it through traditional media for decades and understood uh, what social media reached. It didn't reach the ego, it reached the id. So if you appealed to the id, you'd be able to. Uh, create an atmosphere of influence where you could have your way. And I don't think anybody who studies this, at least you know, in my field, argues that Russia hasn't, uh, uh, Russia has had an un, uh, oversized influence um, on a lot of events in the United States, Ukraine, Britain, Spain, and elsewhere. Um, and it continues to wield uh, influence because it understands the moment and understands the technological moment and how to manipulate it. And the barrier to that ought to be uh, American journalism. Uh, and we'll get to, to why, why that's not the case. So era number one, 1880s to 1890s. Uh, you know, really a brawling era in American history. That's when you had rapid industrialization, rapid corporatization, uh, really widening gap in incomes and so on and so forth. Uh, railroads ran 167,000 miles of track, so you had you know, communication by rail, distribution of goods and people, uh, the refinement and widespread deployment of the telegraph meant you could have near breaking news um, transmitted to your local region, to your town, which would then be replicated in a uh, newspaper and distributed to a wider population. Roll fred pr uh, fed presses allowed for the millions of copies of news articles to be distributed. Uh, it's unknown to history until this point, where you could have so much information distributed to so many people in such a short period of time. Urbanization in the United States, fed by immigration in large measure, shifted the demographics. And you had education for white people. That means, you know, that's literacy. And if you're literate, you could read the newspaper. There's nothing about critical thinking. It says you could read the information and perhaps act on it in terms of uh, electoral politics. But education became common. 18 million children between the ages of 5 and 18 were educated uh, you know, by the 1880s, much more so than had been 40 years earlier because of the development of public schools. And the whole job of the public school system was to teach children how to read, do some maths, but principally how to read because democracy depended on an informed citizenry. And the telegraph, you know, it's a piece of technology, transmits news uh, from the frontier, which in turn creates a demand for more news from the frontier, which in turn creates demand for heroes and sensational stories and whatnot. It permitted local papers to carry national news. Uh, mechanical typesetting replaced artisanal hand composition of plates, so you've mechanized the whole process of information distribution. You know, and, you know, the rotary uh, presses allowed magazines and newspapers to flourish, millions of, of copies. The railroads I described distributed all this stuff. So all this technology interconnected, all in service really to information. And more Americans knew how to read than ever before. America itself went from 50 million to 76 million in, you know, in 20 years. That's a huge population increase. And all these technological elements are in play uh, to create what <coughs> theorists at the time wanted to be an educated, enlightened citizenry, you know, much as, you know, Periclean Athens. Uh, so did the public become enlightened? No. No. 
didn't. It had all these wonderful technologies giving them wonderful information around the world. And no, they really weren't interested. Uh, that's the headline from the New York Journal about destruction of the worship main was the work of an enemy trying to fire up um, America to go to war with Spain and um, take its, uh, its territories. Uh, journalism of this period uh, did feature some sober analysis, but for the most part it was sensationalistic, exaggerated, and stories about crime and political scandal, children, you know, stuff like that, light fare, that sort of thing. And it worked. People couldn't get enough of this information. They really weren't interested in the hardcore political analysis. They wanted they wanted scandal, they wanted crime. You know, if it bleeds, it leads, as they say in TV news, and, that's, and that was the case before television. You know, Hearst and Pulitzer raced to the, well, they funded this, but sorry, Joe. Uh, they, they raced to the bottom in covering um, news stories that were more, uh, that were appealing more toward um, a less analytical side of our brain. Um, and it, blame it all on this kid. That kid right there, the yellow kid, from which yellow journalism is named. He was a cartoon character. If you read the cartoons, they're rather acerbic, and they do comment on the state of the world, but people were interested in just the yucks they could get out of this. And that's always made newspapers highly unusual, because you had in the same product news alongside comics, alongside horoscopes, Fake news, I guess you'd call that. Uh, it, it, it just this amalgam of information types, all choreographed within the same plane. And so it's not unusual for people to somewhat be confused that what they read on page one and what they read in, uh, on page seven reflect two different realities. One sober, one not so much. And of course, there's the crossword puzzle. Now, the yellow kid. Uh, really describes the era of the news yellow journalism. Uh, you know, to be sure, the Associated Press distributed information uh, widely. And this is very important uh, to grasp because the Associated Press served to come up with the common narrative on which Americans could act on. That's the common story or a common set of facts. You had a common set of facts that p people pretty much agreed on that then could be used to debate policy and so on and so forth. The Associated Press put, played, a, played a key key role in that, but it still wasn't enough. That line between fact and opinion continued to be blurred because of the sensational coverage of stuff. I mean, there was some investigative reporting. Ira, you know, Ida Tarbell series in Standard Oil and McClure's magazine led to the breakup of the company. But the muckrakers, quite frankly, didn't win. They had some great work that we talk about today, but at the time, they, they didn't win because newspapers continued to privilege crime and scandals over detailed reporting. So the great societal ills and psychological dislocations of the day were often ignored, particularly among the poor, certainly among African Americans and American Indians, and immigrants. So that kind of made it difficult to get a consensus. Although that consensus was accessible through the narrative constructed by the Associated Press, the press it was very difficult. So there is, quite frankly, a lot of uh, confusion about what was real and what was not, what was the reality and what was the alternative or alternate reality. And now then we come to our second era here, 20s, 1920s and 30s, another you know, disruptive piece of uh, technology coming on, uh, electric media, radio and, and film. You know, in the 20s, they were trying to find their footing. They didn't actually quite know what to be. Um, but they would secure a place in the news ecosystem by the 1930s. Newspapers, meanwhile, moved from strength to strength because of the growth of advertising and consumer culture. They were just printing money because of advertising. And a new profession, public relations, joined the fray to help promote companies and special interests. So that was a way that sort of information fed into the news systems as, as well. Uh, just to give you some figures, as you know, I, I, do, like, I do like statistics. Uh, <laughs> um, 
Why not? Uh, in 1880, newspapers generated about 40 million in advertising. By 1924, it was almost a billion dollars. That's an astonishing figure. Just, this is all going to one sector of the economy. Subscriptions brought in another 398 million. So this is a, newspapers are an industry, a cash flow of over a billion dollars. That's a very important industry. That's why the people who own them made a lot of, lot of money. The 1920s were indeed roaring. And that just, this is an old chart from a book in 1915 that I, uh, I keep around because it just shows an astonishing increase um, you know, in the revenue of, the, of newspapers. That meant they were influential. People were reading them. But what were they printing? Well, they were printing the same stuff they printed in the 19th century. Um, um, uh, also in the 1920s, tabloid journalism or jazz journalism emerged in urban areas. Uh, this was more a reflection of popular culture. Uh, it promoted sex, violence, and other sensations. In fact, there was one New York newspaper, the, the Evening Graphic, uh, was known informally as the Porno Graphic because of its display of women, you know, joined the Daily News and the Daily Mirror on newsstands. Uh, traditional journalism, however, did something it had never done before. It adopted a code of ethics. It, like the New York Times said, we are going to play it down the middle. We are going to be balanced. We're going to be objective. We're going to stick to the facts. Uh, newspaper reporters, in particular, and editors understood that society in the 1920s and 30s was growing increasingly complex. And the newspapers really were the only instrument for the public to make sense of the world. So this code of ethics emerged uh, to sort of marginalize the fake news, the sensational news, to make sure the reporting was, was down the middle. Uh, but guess which side won? Let's, I take this quote from the period from the great Gatsby. So we beat on boats against the current, borne back ceaselessly to the past. Basically, newspapers went back to the 19th century. They still focused on sensationalism, such as this from the daily news of uh, execution of a woman. Dead. Whoa. Well, it sold newspapers. So they did it. You know, radio and film established themselves on firmer ground, uh, you know, in the 30s, with radio becoming uh, an essential part of the uh, home life, domestic life. Uh, but only a, a small percentage focused on news, 1% in 1925. Uh, sports, music, and dramas continued to dominate. But the radio was there, and it would be used for news as time went on. And there's the kid, you know, with the dog listening to the radio. And that, that kid represents a young adult in the 1940s who depended on radio for information, particularly about World War II. You know, and, uh, film's relationship to news was important because it brought the world to movie theaters through newsreels. So you went to see a, a film, you would see before the film a newsreel which brought you scenes from around the world in black and white on the big screen. So it showed the power of visualization of, of, of news. Uh, but these tended to follow a very specific format. Uh, there'd be some violence or some war, uh, then there'd be a, a piece on a kid, and then there'd be a piece on an animal, and you always ended up at the last, the last would always be something funny. It's in many ways to let people know that the world's okay. Even though we first showed you a lot of uh, bloodshed, at the end of the newsreel, we're showing you animal acts and kids. So everything's going to be okay, because that's what the people wanted to see. Uh, and newsreels did hold a significant impact in the 1940s in bringing World War II home to America, but it was all heavily censored. And then we get to the 60s and the 70s. Now, who's that guy working in the newsroom in the 1970s? That's me. I'm wearing the thing, man. I got the beard. I got the tie. I'm working the horn. I'm trying to get some news, 70s style. <laughs> it's actually, I think, 81 or something. But uh, the, news, the news had changed dramatically by the 1960s and 70s. The confluence of forces from previous eras in American history, you know, kind of uh, formed what you now look back on as a golden age. Uh, local and network news became more mature, uh, more bolted uh, to serving the community, um, and they became part of the daily routines for millions, tens of millions of Americans. 
had to get home by 6, you had to watch the local news, then you wanted to watch the, the evening news. That hour was for news. And it was delivered by great anchors like Diane Smith. You know, uh, it was not such great news for the evening newspapers, however. Eh, you didn't need the evening newspaper when you could watch the news on TV. But there was also an economic reason. The second and third shifts began to disappear from America's landscape as deindustrialization accelerated in this period. So second and third shift workers who would buy the evening newspaper and bring it to work to read to their lunch, and during their lunch were no longer available. So there wasn't the base uh, for subscribers uh, in that area. So the evening newspaper disappeared, by and large, by the end of the 70s. Uh, morning uh, newspapers uh, fell uh, a little bit, but they merged with the remnants of the evening newspapers to continue their upward, upward trajectory, uh, because television just over overwhelmed. All news radio came up in, the, in 1960, and in New York in 65, WO 1010 wins, CBS radio. So news really joins the all news uh, parade in the 1960s. So you could get news by radio, you could get news by television, you could get it by um, newspapers and magazines. And that's a radio, for those of you who don't know. Okay. <laughs> you know, so who lost in the golden age of journalism in the 60s? Uh, you know, in seventies. Well, the evening newspapers, theatrical uh, newsreels, um, all decimated by TV. And, and TV also had another piece of technology called the satellite, which allowed global events to be beamed live back to the United States. So they could also transmit uh, packaged reports by satellite. Uh, so they could have reporters in the far-flung areas of the world reporting back by satellite to give the folks a global uh, perspective in what I call near real time. Um, live satellite feeds were a little clunky, a little, little more difficult um, to navigate or manage because you had to reserve time because there weren't as many. Um, and it was difficult when you had three networks all trying to reserve the same time on the, on the satellites. You know, meanwhile, you had a fresh generation of reporters educated at journalism schools, learning the code of ethics, but learning the investigative reporting. And they did this investigative reporting principally in Vietnam. They actually went out with the, they were not controlled as, as they were in World War II. They went out um, into the uh, uh, combat zone. They went into the, uh, you know, the, the theater with troops and commanders and just openly asked them questions. And TV had very, very lightweight cameras and then later some video. They were able to develop that film, transmit it by uh, satellite from Tokyo, and then get it to the United States on the evening news. So near real time battle footage. Um, and that really, really upped the ante for journalism. It showed that journalism, journalists could affect the world. Uh, but there is also some troubling aspects of this thing called new journalism, this blending of fact through reporting and perspective of that reporting. So it's no longer objective, there is perspective. But Tom Wolfe and other great writers practiced it. That was thrown into the mix, and that seemed to confuse the public as well. Uh, and there were also these alternative weeklies emerging in college towns and urban areas. These are free publications. They had young writers who are experimenting with the language, experimenting with subjects to cover, uh, just all modeled on the Village Voice, which came out in 1955. Interestingly enough, they really, really reflected the culture of the day. They took advertising from head shops and purveyors of marijuana paraphernalia, um, along with record stores and, and record labels and, and whatnot. And they wrote this sort of amalgam of popular culture and news. All these elements were in play in the early 70s, and the journalistic shift really becomes pronounced uh, with Watergate, uh, and, and that bolted investigative re uh, reporting to the daily job of journalists. So but the news ecosystem by the end of the 70s included morning and evening television news programs, all news radio stations, morning newspapers, all weeklies, and so on. Newspaper circulation peaked in 1980 at 62.3 million. It's nowhere near that number today. And now we go quickly to the present. You know, that golden age of journalism persisted through the 1980s as the value of newspapers and television stations grew. When you had that amount of, if you had that circulation, you could sell ads, you could sell ads, you could make money. And to put it in perspective, New Haven Register sold for more than $200 million in the mid-1980s. 
more than 200 million. Uh, it was sold last year when bundled with a whole bunch of other properties for 50 million. So look how much value it lost, majority of its value in a generation. I mean, the Jackson family is very pleased. They got out at the peak and they made a ton of money. But now, I mean, 50 million is nothing for a media company. Uh, but that's what, t local, that's, that's what newspapers fetch. For like the Hartford Current, what's that gonna fetch? I don't know. Um, local TV has retained its value more so than, than newspapers for good reason, because people still watch. I mean, just uh, over the weekend, you know, Nexstar offered to buy 42 Tribune stations, including Fox 61, down the road, for 4.1 billion. So TV is still, still percolating pretty good, but its days may be numbered as well. We just don't know. So the present spasm of technology has, has really uh, rolled through traditional media. Newspapers are disappearing as readers are moved to the internet, on desktops, then laptops, now on phones. Daily circulation is now 31 million. I suspect it's even less than that. That seems to be a generous um, number. I, I suspect it's below 30 million uh, today. Um, newspapers have sought to rebuild their brand online, but they can't make any money on it because you can't make any money really selling digital ads. The disappearance of malls took away anchor tenants like JCPenney and Sears, so you don't have those advertisements to support your newspaper. Uh, E-commerce has taken away other shops that wouldn't ordinarily have advertised as the geographical horizon you know, has flattened. You could sell anything anywhere to anybody. Uh, Craigslist took all the classifieds. And even auto, the, the consolidation in auto dealerships is playing a role. I don't know if you've noticed here in Connecticut where the old mom and pop auto dealers are being rolled up by some of the bigger auto dealers in the state. Well, that's taken away advertising from newspapers. Uh, so you put all that into play with the internet and its plug and play capacity to write and create news by anybody. You don't have to be a trained journalist. This has led to what's called news deserts. I know it's very difficult to see, but there are more than 1,400 communities in the United States uh, that do not have a local newspaper anymore. So there's no watchdog. So and you have cutbacks at existing newspapers. The Hartford Current, just this week, Matt Kaufman, top investigative reporter, Pulitzer finalist, no longer works there. Peter Pock, a great editorialist, no longer works there. Catherine Megan, no longer works there. Just this week, we had these uh, of layoffs. And because that line between politics and fact has now, as Professor <laughs> pointed out, is now blurred, even meteorologists on TV are being accused of politi political leanings in their forecasts. Yeah, just here's just a little quote from Government Executive Magazine, and maybe one of the few non-government executives to read it. But meteorologists are concerned that they're being accused of politicizing forecasts. But that's the environment we live in. You know, so in short, we've really never left the 19th century. It's sensationalism, it's scandal, it's opinion with some fact thrown in that seems to rule the day. And you know, with that, I will turn the program over to uh, my colleague from the University of Hartford, Adam, to talk, and former student of mine, to talk about the online world. Adam? Diane? I'll have Adam come up in just a second, but I had to note, uh, Rich, when you mentioned the Village Voice as an alternative weekly, just shut down last month. Yeah. You talked about cutbacks. Um, Thomson Reuters today announcing it'll cut back 20% of its staff by next year. Uh, you talked about satellite news and television. I remember when, uh, in order to get a, a live shot from Simsbury to New Haven, we had to use a satellite truck. And so the signal went from the truck 18,000 miles up in the air, hit a satellite and came 18,000 miles down to our receiver on the top of Channel 8, and you saw it as though it was instantaneous. But it was a 36,000 mile journey, pretty crazy. Um, I'd like to introduce Adam Chiara. He is uh, the Applied Assistant Professor in the School of Communication at the University of Hartford, where he teaches courses in social media, public relations, and digital media. 
He is an authority on issues relating to social media's impact on politics and media, a regular contributor for The Hill, and frequently interviewed for expert commentary on a number of topics relating to social media and its impact. Earlier in his career, Adam was an award-winning journalist working in the Hartford area. He has a background in politics, public policy, and legislative process from the time he spent managing political campaigns and working at the Connecticut General Assembly. Adam? All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Just give me one second to uh, close out this PowerPoint and put on mine. All right, so I'm going to start off with a story here, and it involves three characters. A reporter from Yahoo News, an angry man, and Kim Kardashian. Sounds like a great start to uh, these three walked into a bar, but I promise you this is a true story. So there is a Yahoo reporter, and he was on a panel similar to this with other journalists, and he's sitting up there, and he gives a, they give a talk about journalism and the state of, the state of journalism, and at the end, uh, a man stands up for a question. Not this man, I don't want to get the stock footage guy in trouble, but a man like this stands up, and he's, you know, hey, great panel, except for I can't believe you would have that clown from Yahoo News up there. So, of course, the reporter has to defend his honor, right? And he says, oh, well, thank you for attending, sir, but um, if you don't mind, why am I a clown? Well, I go to Yahoo all the time, and whenever I go to Yahoo, all I get is Kim Kardashian and Miley Cyrus and all this celebrity gossip. That's all you people do there. So the reporter says, oh, if you don't mind, if I could ask you a follow-up question. When you say you go to Yahoo, do you go to Yahoo politics page or the current event or the world events page? You know, where are you going on Yahoo? And he goes, no, I go to Yahoo. I open up Yahoo, yahoo.com, and there it is, all of that junk. And that's when the reporter knew he got him. And he said, well, you see, sir, we do something called cookies with Yahoo. So what we do is pretty much put a tracking device in your browser. And when you leave Yahoo, it tracks other places you go and sees the other kind of content that you view. And then when you come back to Yahoo, it figures out who you are, a profile of you, and then it serves you back content that you've been seeing around the web. So, if you're getting Kim Kardashian and Miley Cyrus and celebrity news, that's probably because that's what you've been viewing around the web, and Yahoo's just feeding it back. Of course, the, the guy grumbles something, you know, turns red, sits down, is, is embarrassed. Um, but I, I tell this story because I think it encapsulates where we are right now in the media ecosystem um, online here. And that's that information is tailored to us. All news, all information is tailored to us, sometimes without us even being aware. So just again to, to recap this, because I know it's going to be a uh, difficult concept, a cookie, think of it as almost a tracking device. So you open up Google Chrome, or you open up uh, Safari, or Firefox, or whatever, whatever, however you go to the internet. Some sites will put these little tracking devices, these cookies, in your browser. So even when you leave the site, you could be gone, have that page closed, you could have Yahoo closed for you know, a week. It's still figuring out where you're going and figuring out who you are. Oh, you like the New York Giants. Oh, we see, you seem to like stories about politics. Oh, you seem to like uh, you know, food and or celebrity. And then when you come back to Yahoo, right, or you come back to some of these pages, you'll see, a different, you'll see different stories highlighted. Um, I might see different stories than Rich Hanley will see, right? We'll see different stories appear on our homepage because they base it off what is, it that you, what is it that you like? Who are you as a person? We're getting tailored news. And that's the stage that we're in right now. And nowhere is this more prominent than on social media. Right? This is where we really have the, the tracking and the profiling going on. So here's why this could be concerning. This is a stat for you. About two-thirds of Americans get at least some of their news on social media. Now this is the broad, this is the broad snapshot. You break it down by demographic, it's going to change, right? So younger Americans, it's going to be way higher percentage, and it's going to be most of their news from social media. Older Americans, it's going to be a little bit less, but yet still, there's growing, they're increasing, um, seeing more and more news from social media as well. But as a general snapshot, about two-thirds of Americans get their news from social media. Now here's, let's take Facebook, the primary, the primary uh, platform. Facebook does what I just described before with, with the cookies. What they do is they track who you are. They figure out a profile of who you are, right? Some of that is based on information that you volunteer to them. So you say, when you fill out your profile, 
you give them your gender, you give them where you live, you give them uh, you know, some other, some key demographic information about you. Some of the information Facebook will get from you is based on what you like, right? So every time you press like or share or you engage with the post, Facebook's remembering that. It's figuring out who you are. It's learning about you. It's kind of writing you know, a dossier of you, right? Facebook also uses cookies. They do exactly what Yahoo does. So when you leave Facebook, right, Facebook is tracking still. You have Facebook closed, and it's still figuring out where you're going across the web, figuring out who you are, what you like, what sites you're going to. All this is, again, making a profile of you. And now here's where it all ties in together, and here's where it gets a little concerning. It then feeds back the content it thinks you want to see. So you go onto Facebook, and it doesn't go in chronological order anymore. It's bumping up posts that they think that you're going to want to see. Because they want to, what, what's Facebook's goal? Well, they want to keep you on the platform. They want to keep you on as long as possible. How do they do that? They keep giving you content that you want to see, right? So you got to stay on the platform. So they're going to post, you know, if you, again, if you're a New York Giants fan here, they're going to be posting up New York Giants posts, whether it's a friend that posts something, whether it's some article that you're, some site that you're following. You're following ESPN. Well, when they see that there's a New York Giants post, bam, it's going to pop that up to the top, right? So they're, they're constantly giving you information that you want to see. This is leading us to two major issues, the filter bubble and confirmation bias. Both have been around forever, but let's explain why it's even uh, you know, more intense on social media. So let's talk about what the filter bubble is. The filter bubble is that what we just going over here, information that constantly, um, that that's, that's information that you have already, you know, predisposition to want to see, constantly being fed to you, and then it continues to grow. So you're just continuing to get stuck into this bubble, right? I'll give an example here. Let's say I'm a uh, chocolate ice cream person. I like chocolate ice cream. Don't like vanilla ice cream, right? Facebook figures this out for me. I should just back up and say this is, this is not, a, a, this is an extreme example, but this is just to make a point here, a little analogy. So, Every time a friend of mine posts something about chocolate ice cream that's positive, because Facebook has figured out I like chocolate ice cream, it's going to put that up there. Anytime there's a, a story that, deal, that talks about how chocolate ice cream is going to make you live 20 years longer than vanilla ice cream, that's going to get popped up, and I'm going to keep seeing that. I go, oh, that's a good thing I like chocolate ice cream, right? And then I'm going to like that. I'm going to like that post. And Facebook goes, oh, good, he likes that post. He likes that post about chocolate ice cream. We'll give him another one next time. And next time an advertiser wants to sell a chocolate ice cream, uh, chocolate ice cream T-shirt, that's going to pop up there too, right? And I say, oh, look at this, a chocolate ice cream t-shirt for sale. That's great. I like that. And I say, oh, they know about you. Facebook goes, good, good. They're liking the content we give them. Keep seeing chocolate ice cream, right? It's putting me into a bubble. It's putting me into a bubble. This leads to confirmation bias. So my worldview is that chocolate ice cream is better than vanilla ice cream. And the confirmation bias uh, I'm getting, this, this is getting confirmed. Every time I see these posts, every time I see a friend talking about how great chocolate ice cream is, I go, that's right, other people like chocolate ice cream. Every time I see a t-shirt that's, you know, cute, that's saying chocolate, you know, uh, I love chocolate ice cream, I go, oh, it's great. Look at how many other people want to buy this t-shirt. Chocolate ice cream is the best. Then all of a sudden, uh, you know, maybe where Facebook starts giving me some of the negative stuff about vanilla ice cream, right? Maybe some posts talk about, maybe some news story talks about how vanilla ice cream actually decreases your lifespan. Facebook goes, oh, he'll want to see that. They post that, put that up there. I go, oh, yeah, that's right. That's why I don't like vanilla ice cream, because look at what, it's terrible for your health. Uh, maybe some T-shirt that shows up that's vanilla ice cream, um, and there's uh, some text over it that says, lock it up, lock it up. Good, I'm glad you guys got that one. There you go, and that's my connection now, right? And all of a sudden now you've got this filter bubble, and you've got your confirmation bias, and they're working together. And the truth is, you might not even notice that it's happening. And even if you're informed, an informed person, you could get stuck in this trap. Let me give you an example. Not as extreme as my chocolate ice cream, vanilla ice cream, but another example. Um, so the hurricane last year in Puerto Rico. When the hurricane happened, we all, <clears throat> we all knew about the story. It's on social media, you see it on TV, right? It was in the news, it was in the news. A few weeks later though, like any story, it starts to trickle away and you start seeing less of it and you start seeing less posts of it, right? Story leaves your mind. Unless all your friends or most of your friends on Facebook um, are from Puerto Rico, or you live in a community that have a lot of Puerto Rican ties, right? They're going to constantly be posting still stuff about the humanitarian crisis that's going on and how they're not getting help and all these issues. And you constantly keep seeing that, right? So in your world, in your world, your tailored world, you're saying, how come, how come no one else is getting 
is all upset about this? How has come to his left? Look, every day I'm seeing a new story about this. Whereas maybe me, I don't have a strong connection to Puerto Rico, right? I don't see it anymore. We're living, starting to live in different realities, right? Because the information is being tailored to us. And this is, this is concerning. Um, and this goes back to what Professor Hanley was talking about, you know, before in the 80s, let's say, 70s and 80s, we had a shared set of facts. We had a, a national narrative. Well, what's our national narrative on social media? That's where most people are getting some information from. And like I said, some, some uh, ages and demographics, that's where the majority of their information comes from. Where's the national narrative? If everything's being tailored, we're all in different, we're all in different silos. And it's just becoming more and more extreme. And there's also others that have figured out to take advantage of this. We've talked about Russian influence, right? Russian interference. Well, they figured this out too, because something you can do with these platforms, with Facebook, is you can target content. So you can say, I want to put this story, I want to, or I want to target this, this post. I want to target it to uh, people that are 60, 65 and older, that live in this part of the country, that, um, I don't know, make this kind of income, right? You can get that specific, and you can target content, and so that they will just see that. And of course, you're feeding inform information that goes into their filter bubble. It confirms their bias. So we have these issues because of the, the, the new medium of social media. I don't mean to be hyperbolic here, but some are saying that we're in the information apocalypse. This has entered the lexicon of, of uh, media scholars, the information apocalypse. Now, we've already entered it, but it's about to get a lot worse, and I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. Um, so there's a few reasons for this information apocalypse. One, like we just talked about, right? Not only do we have, are we becoming more and more siloed, um, but we're having less trust in the media, which I will also get into. Uh, we also have anybody as a publisher, so anybody can create content. Manipulation of content, ooh, that's a good, that's what I'm about to talk about. Manipulation of content, and that's really where the fear is of why we're saying we're about, we're in the information apocalypse, but, but how it's actually going to, you know, come to fruition is the last piece of this, is the manipulation. But we have all these different factors, is what you need to know. Start to build up right now. And a big one is fake videos that are coming. So this is, I'm giving you guys the, the preview. This is going to be a huge story in five, maybe 10 years. But I guarantee, I guarantee within 10 years, you're gonna start to hear more of these stories. So let's talk about fake videos and how this is all re relating to the information apocalypse and where we're living here. Um, this is a story I wrote for uh, The Hill, a piece I wrote for The Hill um, a few months ago, and it's actually, there's been more, that's, uh, more information that's come out since then that's even more disturbing. But basically, videos now are being uh, easier and easier to manipulate. So we all know, like, you can do it with photos, right? I mean, Stalin used to do this, have people removed from images, right? Something different, though, with an image from a photo than from video, from having somebody actually hear their voice that sounds the same, and see that face talk, right? And it's becoming to the point now where um, these programs that can create manipulated videos are starting to hit the mass market. In fact, in some sectors, it already has. They're called deep fakes, and where it's, been, where it's huge, the porn industry. Yeah, that's right. They put celebrity faces, any celebrity you want. You can put it on somebody, and it looks just like that person, right? Um, and that's kind of where it started to grow its roots. Now, though, it's trickling into other aspects, and we can talk about some of those dangers I, I didn't want to play the video because I didn't know how the sound was going to be here. But what I did is I just took, uh, you know, this is just a GIF, so it's just a moving picture. But these were two videos. Uh, one is fake, one is real. And I know you can't hear it. And I know that's only a few seconds. But I just wanted to illustrate the point here. You have to trust me on this. I'm not, I'm not giving you fake news on this. You have to trust me on this. You, I watched these videos 15 times. I could not tell the difference. I could not figure out which one was which, which one was the fake or real one. They've gotten that good. Um, now, this one that was created was done by some, I believe this was MIT, but by some MIT students uh, with their programs. Some of the, you'll, you know, you'll see some of the other ones that are just amateurs in the mass market that aren't as good as this, but here's the point. We're going to get to the point where anybody's going to be able to do this, right? Because it's just the evolution of technology, where anybody's going to be able to, with just a little training or a little time or just watching some YouTube videos to figure it out with a cheap program that they could spend, you know, a thousand bucks to get, be able to make these, to make these videos. And once they can do that, here's the other part of the, uh, the information apocalypse. They have a distribution network. So let's take the, that Stalin photo I said, right? So Stalin was able to get that person out of the picture, 
Right? And then he had to have state-run media to, to put that in to show, you know, to, to uh, make it legitimate. Well, now we have social media. And guess what? I should have put a, another example of Ronald Reagan. But you don't like Donald Trump? You don't like Hillary Clinton? Well, you could make that video. You could get that into that filter bubble we were talking about. It confirms their bias. What do they care if it's real or not? It's confirming what they, what they want to believe. And now all of a sudden, you know, it's, it's entered the mainstream. And we don't know what's real or not. We don't know what's credible or not. You could probably imagine a scenario with the Access Hollywood tape. What if we were in a scenario where fake videos were just the everyday, you know, we, this is something that we have to combat every day. Could you just not say, well, I, I didn't say that. And it's hard to believe. It's hard to know now, right? So I know what some of you are saying. Don't worry, Adam. We got the news media. They're going to be able to tell us what's real or not. They're going to be the, they're going to be the referees in all this, right? Feeling hopeful? Let's take a look at a September Gallup poll. Here was a question. In general, how much trust and confidence do you have in the mass media, such as newspapers, TV, and radio, when it comes to reporting the news fully, accurately, and fairly? A great deal, a fair amount, not very much, or none at all. What do you, what do you all think? Get a number in your head. You got your number? 54% had not very much in the mass media or none at all. 54%. Now, of course, again, just like my two-thirds stat here, this, this is a general Snapchat. Oh, Snapchat. Jeez. Look at that. It's Freudian slip there. Snapshot, right? So it depends on uh, political leanings, age, a lot of different factors. I understand that. But generally, we have 54% do not. So if, if more than half have you know, little trust or don't trust in the media, we have no referees. Again, we have no national narrative. And that's concerning. Do I have you all gloomy now? You're all depressed? Don't worry. I'm going to leave you with a positive here. I don't think, I don't think um, you know, that we're, we're doomed. I think there is hope. So here's my solution to it, or at least what I think we need to be doing. We need to be spending more time in schools teaching media literacy, right? And when I say schools, I don't mean college, where I usually get the students. And I have some intelligent, brilliant students, you know, but some of it isn't is their fault. They get to me, and they haven't had a lot of this training. And some of the stuff that they say to me, I go, oh, man, we really failed you. <laughs> we really failed you that you come here and you, you can't, uh, you know, decipher which source is accurate and what's not. You know, don't understand the media ecosystem. That's on us. It needs to start early. I mean, it needs to start in third or fourth grade. Why? Because third and fourth graders have phones already, right? I think we need to be starting them right away, teaching them about media literacy and the media ecosystem and what happens online. And that information is tailored to you. And what fake, fake videos and that fake photos and how easy it is and, and all of that. I mean, we spend so much time, and I believe in this, but we spend so much time on teaching the uh, classics of literature, right? We spend so much time, I don't know if they still do spelling, maybe, right? Handwriting, I don't know if that's still a part of it. All these, yet we spend almost no time on something that they spend hours on a day, sometimes way too much time, hours on a day, and it's so vital to our democracy. We spend no time on it. Maybe a, little, maybe a class in high school, right? And then if you're lucky, if you decide to take one in college, in college. So there is still hope. I like to, I like to use this analogy here. Ever watch a, a horror movie or sci-fi movie, right? And let's take the horror movie. You know, you see the, the person driving on the, the, the road and their gas is low and they pass a gas station and they say, oh, I'll get gas later, right? And then all of a sudden the storm starts to come and they go, no, nah, I'm not going to pull over to that hotel. We'll just, we'll just keep going. We'll get through tonight. Then their car breaks down and uh, there's some barn down the street and somebody says, let's, stay, let's sleep in the car tonight. No, let's go, let's go to that barn and see somebody's there. All right? And you start to see the, the, the impending doom coming. And the whole time you're going, no, don't do it. Just stay in your car. Go get the gas, right? All the warning signs are there. Why are you doing this to yourself? Or the sci-fi movie. Well, what, you know, why are you training those robots to be smarter than us? Don't do it. There's still time. Don't, you can turn back. We're in that stage right now with this, with this information crisis, right? We're in this stage right now where all the warning signs are there. And if we just take a step back and realize some of the things that we need to do, like not walk towards that barn or get some gas or not train that robot to be smarter than all of mankind, if we do that now, we can prevent the huge information crisis. Because something that I didn't get into at this talk is I think there's a lot, you know, I think there, there is more 
um, pros to, to all this, the media ecosystem that we live, the negatives. I know it didn't sound like that from my talk, but I think there are more pros. Think about this time of history that we live in. If I wanted to right now, I could pull out my phone, I could read some stories from China, I could follow almost any journalist across the country, I could listen to podcasts from the most intelligent people in the world, right? Almost virtually for free, which is not great for the news industry, right? But I, I can get this for, for almost free or close to it. Uh, I have unlimited amount of information. That's amazing. That, wasn't, that didn't exist 20, 30 years ago, right? It's, I'm, I'm young, so in my lifetime, that's when that's happened. That, and we take it for granted, we all do, right? But at any moment I could pull out my phone and be connected to all these information sources. What an amazing power that we all have. But we have to teach it. Because if we don't teach them how to do it right, then it's just gonna go to waste. So we're at that point of the movie where we could go either way. I do believe, I do believe, you know, conversations like this, enough attention that we will write, you know, write the course, um, but it's gonna be up to us. So, so there's some time, but just not a lot. Thank you all, I really appreciate it, and I know I'm, I'm staying up here, right? Okay, thank you. I'd like to ask the other panelists to join us. That was great, Adam. Richie should be proud of your student. Turned out a great journalist well, and a great, great teacher. Did a good job. He was yes. I'm afraid of him. Did, he <laughs> no, he said you were a student That's right. before you, you talked, did. so That's that was right. great. That was good. Very good. Um, I think it's interesting, Adam, that you talked about, you know, evaluating news sources and figuring out um, media literacy. So my question for you is, I agree with you that that's really important, and I try to teach it to my students too, but what if people don't care? What if they like the sources they're using, and they don't believe, when you tell them to evaluate it and how legitimate it is, what if they don't believe you that that's legitimate? That's a great question. You know, um, I'm, I promise you, I'm going to get to this. Okay. I'm going to sidetrack for a second okay. and go to it. So when I was writing that, that piece for The Hill about the video manipulation, mm -hmm. I was interviewing a professor from Arizona State who studies mm -hmm. this. And, and he's a big believer in the free market. Mm -hmm. He says there are going to be free market solutions mm -hmm. to this, right, to being able to figure out what's fake or not. And I asked the same question. I said, I agree with you. I, I hope the free market mm -hmm. solves it. But in, for in order for the free market to want, you know, to, to mm -hmm. work and to have these programs that combat this, yeah. people are going to have to have a will Right. And a desire. Right. Um, so, you know, what I say to, to my students, at least, is, you know, getting this disinformation and misinformation and confirmation bias, right, it might feel good in the moment, just like, you know, you drink a little bit too much that night. That feels good. The next day, that hangover is pretty bad, right? And so if you're not, if you're not paying attention to this, you know, if you're just going along and you're okay with getting this, this uh, poor quality of information, eventually it's going to catch up to you, whether it's going to be we're going to get poorly elected officials that are going to hurt your pocketbook, mm -hmm. whether it's gonna be your environment's gonna get destroyed because mm -hmm. you're being told one thing and something else is happening. Um, so, you know, I think over time, hopefully what happens, is, not hopefully, I hope we don't even get to this point, but when these negative effects start to happen to us, then maybe people start to realize, you know, because we're not involved with the news, because we're not uh, caring about these quality mm -hmm. sources, look at these, these effects. That's the worst case scenario. I would like to hopefully, like we said beforehand, be able to teach younger people about this and so they can understand how it could have negative effects. But until I think something negative happens to you, mm -hmm. if you want to be stuck in your confirmation in your filter bubble, mm -hmm. you know, that's your choice as an American. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think we have to take on the idea that the free market can solve it. The free market has brought us to being the most unequal society in the world. That was the free market. The advocates of the free market are people who really do not want to have a functioning political system that might regulate them in any way. Uh, the free market will not solve it as such. It's how we think about affecting its moves. Uh, you have to create incentives that make the free market do what we need to have happen. But frankly, it's an idiot idea that the free market all by itself will produce anything but disaster for us. It won't do it. Uh, free choice is not informed choice. Um, so it seems to me that the issue here is, it goes back to, to what you said, that. What can education do, and when must it happen, and how must it happen? You know, we've also uh, defunded our public school system uh, so that the, the room for, and even the money for, the kind of education you're talking about, except in the richest communities, is scant. Now, what does this mean? It means that there are political fights we need to engage in. We need to refund public education and recenter it in the minds of the public. Charter schools are mostly a failure, but that is not what most people know. 
Um, so there, I think there are institutional fights that can affect the free market, but until we make them and succeed at them, and they're long term, we're not going to restore the, the schools, which, by the way, were defunded with a free market argument. More choice makes more accountability. Crap. That's not what's happened. But it's Rich? Well, I, I, I see, you know, particularly you know, disinformation. It's a national security problem. Mm -hmm. um, and our greatest strength is the, is the First Amendment, but it's also our greatest vulnerability. And why is that? And, and there's just a tension between, well, because I can't go to like, a, uh, I can't post stuff on Chinese version of social media because it has to be cleared by censors, but the Chinese can post whatever they want on our social media. They can infiltrate our news system at will, and they do. Um, and same with Russia. Russia's been extraordinarily successful through its psychological operations disinformation division um, in countries with the mo most robust press. Mm -hmm. That would be the United States, the UK, France, France Spain, uh, the, West, the Western democracies with this great enlightenment <laughs> tradition of free speech are now being attacked by that, by a foreign, foreign nation which seeks to weaken the Western alliance. Mm -hmm. And so we, there needs to be some reconciliation between the absolute necessity for the First Amendment and some sort of break on what gets posted and how. And this is where I think a regulatory framework mm -hmm. comes in mm -hmm. in some way. Uh, I teach a class called Disinformation and Truth Decay, and the students have to solve the problem. I give them the technological piece uh, you know, how bots work, how do you deflect bots, and so on. I uh, give them the uh, cognitive bias piece, how do you get people off their pre-existing beliefs, you know, how do you reach their id, in other words. So it's, and, and then I bring in the national security piece, which I show the Gerasimov doctrine, which is this Russian, I'm so old, I almost said Soviet, the, the Russian battle strategy. And I showed them the American battle strategy. And in both cases, uh, the combat theater is surrounded by a circle called information, and whoever controls that information circumference, the perimeter, is going to win the next battle. And we presently, as a nation, don't control it. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean censorship. We just got to find a way to keep bad actors from mm -hmm. posting bad information. And it, there, there needs to be a solution. Education's part of it. Uh, Self-awareness is part of it as well. But I think there's also a leadership issue uh, that... You, leaders need to point out that this is happening, um, and they need to threaten companies like Facebook and Twitter, et cetera, with regulatory oversight if they don't clean up their act, mm -hmm. um, if they don't get bots out of the system, if they, if they're, if they like Apple does, Apple scrubs its data. Um, maybe Facebook shouldn't be allowed to, uh, to retain data on people, but that defeats their business model. Mm -hmm. So this is a very complicated, mm -hmm. very, very uh, unique issue at this moment in time, but it has absolutely dire national security consequences. If you're interested in learning more about uh, what Rich was talking about with bots, uh, the Connecticut Humanities website, uh, if you go to the page that is in, um, talks about this particular initiative about fake news and scroll down, there's actually a game that you can play online that enables you to see how bots work and how uh, when you tweet and someone else tweets and you create a false narrative or you create a, a tweet as though it's coming from a false person, how you gain uh, followers and gain and gain and gain. And it's incredibly, um, I thought I understood the whole thing and when I played the game I was really shocked to see how it works. It's really, I re really recommend it. It's very, it's startling. Um, when you talked about, you were just talking about misinformation, and I would make the point that uh, the word of the year on dictionary.com this year, by the way, that's dictionary.com, not dictionary with the big book you used to carry around. Um, dictionary.com's word of the year is misinformation, uh, which they separate from disinformation. So we have both at work here, right? Yeah, yeah misinformation can be uh, intentional or not. Like a, a, a mistake in a news article can be classified as misinformation, they just misinformed. Mm -hmm. Disinformation is a concerted effort to change mm -hmm. something somewhere in someone's mind mm -hmm. or to change the political calculus. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's much more sophisticated than, than, we, than we as a nation acknowledge. Mm -hmm. and, 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 uh, and we understand, that it's easy to actually to find the sources of this stuff, but if, as Adam pointed out, once you get into the psychographic profile of Facebook users, you can pinpoint, basically, and pardon my 
expression here, the useful idiot. That's the one who has a certain cognitive bias, who has the most followers, uh, who has been known to repeat disinformation in the past, share it and stuff. You just target the useful idiot and have that useful idiot then distribute your message because the useful idiot's not. And that's actually, that's a term of art from uh, clandestine operations. You need a useful idiot to, to get certain things done. And in, in, the, in social media, they're easy to find, they're easy to manipulate, and their messaging works because people trust them. And so there needs to be a way to sort of expose useful idiots in a benign way. Uh, and one way um, that Facebook really amplifies the role of useful idiots is by making its psychographic profiles available for sale mm -hmm. to advertisers. Mm -hmm. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. By the way, if there anyone wants to ask a question or make yeah. a statement, um, Paul, do we have a microphone? We can start right over here. Thank you, a great uh, panel, great presentation. Um, I wonder if the panelists have described the media and journalism as a, a little more monolithic than it really is. I mean, I have not uh, heard any discussion about the alternative press, for example. And if we think back to history, all the way back to uh, Professor O'Connell's time, you know, the, I, I think of the Cherokee Phoenix as sort of a uh, Native American uh, sort of counter narrative to what the majority is saying, or coming into the 20th century, uh, the, the crisis published by uh, the NAACP, or uh, the CIO News published by the Congress of Industrial Organizations, uh, or Pacifica Radio. Uh, and so, uh, so uh, by alternative media, I mean um, media that is uh, institutionally sponsored by a financial source that does not come out of corporate America. And I wonder if, uh, if you've underestimated the role that uh, uh, alternative media has played through American history down to today. Well, I think it was like in my talk, I mentioned alternative weeklies. They're very important during that cultural moment. Uh, but in the 21st century, it's very difficult um, for you know, organizations, as you described, to get appropriate funding and to reach the scale to do the reporting that's necessary. Even a, a, a magazine called The Weekly Standard, I don't know if you're familiar with that, it's a conservative publication. Uh, the editor told employees there yesterday that they don't know if there's a future for the Weekly Standard. And generally, if you have a Republican or a conservative-oriented publication in trouble, that means it's having trouble finding money, which is unusual for that sort of ideology. Um, and so it's, it's very concerning on both sides of the political spectrum that that gap in the news that you rightly identified is going to, it's going to widen and the corporate style media will continue to gobble up smaller papers and like Nexstar mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and Sinclair mm -hmm. um, do with yep. local, local TV stations. Right. And, and, the, and, and so then if you think about it, it's Facebook and Twitter don't dominate two companies. Yeah. But the Weekly Standard is a very interesting and disturbing yeah. example. It is, a, yeah. it is truly conservative. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Unlike the current Republican Party. Oh, right. And, right. They, yeah. And, yeah. And, and they have been critical of it and critical of yeah. the president. So there's a reason they're not getting any corporate funding, because they're not yeah. falling into line, which is one of our problems now, is that, That's a great point. Is that the notion of political voice is now consolidated voices. And if you're unsympathetic to the left, you could make the same argument, actually. Uh, I'm not unsympathetic to the left at all. But, uh, but to lose the weekly standard, and if you'd said I would say this five years ago, it is a loss. Yeah. Uh, and so again, the, the narrowness of voice across the spectrum is one of our problems. And I think that um, to pick up from you, it's clear to me that, that nothing will change without political momentum of complicated various kinds. So the divide between protecting First Amendment rights and some form of regulation of the media is one of the critical points. It would be so easy to get that wrong, even if you had finally the kind of political momentum to push for revisions. Uh, we can't lose free speech. We just yeah. cannot lose Absolutely free not. speech. Mm -hmm. But we also are losing free speech our primary media of free speech. That's your point. That's exactly, that's exactly right. And, it's, and this tension is only going to intensify. 
as we move to the 20, 2020 election. And the technological solutions offered by Facebook and Twitter simply can't keep pace with the uh, algorithms um, that uh, political parties, political operatives, um, and companies working on, like Cambridge, formerly known as Cambridge Analytica, uh, work on. Because they have resources and, and the will um, to, to, to buy off who needs to be bought off to create sophisticated programming that can outwit uh, Facebook and, and Twitter. I mean, I, I actually showed my students, I did this last year and I couldn't sleep after I did it, and I, so I vowed not to do it again. I showed them how to write a bot and program a bot, and I said, I think I did something, I think I've done something terribly wrong here. <laughs> it's, not, it's not that it's difficult, it's just that I was showing them how to be disinformation operators. And I, I, I thought, and I was very disturbed by that, that I was teaching them as a matter of education how to when you find pollute out, the, my field. When you find out <laughs> yeah, that one of them has like a job it. with an unspecified small corporation, you'll know what you've yeah. done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, based in St. Petersburg, yeah. Russia. Yeah. <laughs> or in Cambridge. Or in Cambridge. Yeah, Cambridge. Any other oh, questions yeah. from the audience right yeah. now? Just please raise your hand whenever you want to interject. And, okay, sure. Really need the microphone. Yes, because we're recording on television and we won't be able to pick it up without that. Something that Adam said, and thank you all because I'm listening to this and reflecting on many things. Something that Adam said was about the Reagan side by side, which video? Yeah. If you all recall the Nat Natalie Cole and the Nat King Cole, mm -hmm. when, the, when that first happened, when they did that recording, mm -hmm. taking the dead person's voice, yes. putting the mm -hmm. live person's voice, and I remember thinking to myself, well, if they can do that, what else can they do? And that frightens me. When you showed that, I was just thinking, this is the start of something terrible. Mm -hmm. There's always a good side to it, but there is that negative side. Yeah, for instance, last week there was a concert at uh, UConn, and it was a Maria Callas concert, Love, yeah. the opera singer. She's mm -hmm. been dead since the 1970s. Yeah. She performed live. Mm -hmm. with the Vermont Symphony Orchestra. She literally came out on the stage, and people sitting in the front row said you could not tell it was not her. It's a hologram. It was a hologram. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dolly Parton does that. But, um, and the other thing was... Uh, but she's still thing, alive. Yeah, uh, well, <laughs> yes, she is. I visited, but anyway, no, just kidding. Um, the other thing was the, uh, on Facebook, following the things that you're looking at, and I'm not looking at T-shirts, but a T-shirt came up in Facebook with my name on it, and you know it had a quote on it or something, and you couldn't be, you know, you wouldn't understand because you're not a Ferdinand. I'm like, where did that come from? And it's frightening to me because the news now, I, you, where do you go to really figure out who's telling the truth nowadays? And now we're also skeptical. I, I'm, I'm just not sure where this is going and how we stop this train wreck. That's all I have to say. Okay, so Adam, let's talk a little bit about um, how do you teach students to evaluate uh, news sources? Well, the first thing I say is there are levels of trust. And what I mean by that is, so I, I do this with the students, right? We talk about this, and I say, don't worry about me, Professor Chiara, because I don't trust anybody. I'm skeptical of everything. <laughs> and they're proud of this. And, and you know what? I understand where they're coming yeah. from, because this is the world that they've grown up with, right? Yeah. So in their mind, everything. There's a, an agenda, there's some bias, there's something, right? And I say, look, it's good to be skeptical. Always good to be skeptical. However, you have to have different levels of trust. Uh, and, and you do that based on really, you know, it takes some time. You have to do, you as a media consumer have to do a little research, but figuring out how these organizations get their stories. So there's some telltale signs, right? You know, if there are a few different sources in a story, mm -hmm. you know, that they, and they have different names that they can attribute, you know that they talk to people, that they can, that, that information came from somewhere. Mm -hmm. If they link you to different sources of information and mm -hmm. you can see like the original documents, you're understanding there's some quality, that's a quality piece there. Um, you might not agree with it, you might think, you know, you might still want to learn more facts and get other perspectives, but you at least know how that story was produced. If you see a story where there's nothing that's attributed, mm -hmm. where you don't see any linking to anything, uh, you know, if the headline looks like it's just being scandalous, you have an idea that maybe that story is just trying to get clicks, because mm -hmm. that's, how, that's how they make money, right? A lot of these online publications, it's how many views they get. So, of course, they don't care what's on that page, they want you just to be able to go there. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, the first thing is evaluating what that actual piece of content is. 
And once you've now you found maybe an organization, let's say the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, right, the Hartford Current, that you see apply these over and over again, you can start to say, okay, I have a higher level of trust. They might get things wrong sometimes still. I might have to tra check out other stories, other points of view, just to make sure that mm -hmm. facts align and make my own, you know, mm -hmm. give my own analysis. But I at least know how it was produced. And I think mm -hmm. that's the thing, you know, just being, mm -hmm. becoming an informed media consumer. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the responsibility now is on us. Mm -hmm. And, and that's where it first started, and that's what you were saying, the self -awareness. Okay, so now, Professor O'Connell, you're going to say that, um, yes, the Wall Street Journal, yes, uh, the New York Times, yes, the Hartford Current. Who owns the Hartford Current? Mm -hmm. And what's their agenda? Yes, I am going to say that. <laughs> uh, but, I, but I want to pick up another one of Adam's points. Apart from uh, his, uh, using the term apocalypse, which reinforced the way I did my talk as well about where we are, uh, I'm just an English and history teacher. Uh, I did once teach media but years ago, before, actually before all this exploded. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I have a probably sentimental view of, of an answer to your question. Certainly Adams is thorough and right, but in his talk he raised the problem that when you're a college teacher, you don't get everybody. So whoever chooses to come to Adams' courses is already, this is not a negative, but priest is supposed to at least be curious about what he teaches. But what's happening with all the others? Uh, it's a problem right now in any field except economics. All my students take economics courses. I'm the worst teachers in the college. And, uh, <laughs> and I must argue many of the most stupid, but that's a whole other issue. <laughs> um, and most of my students take STEM courses. They do not take courses that ask them to think analytically slash creatively. And I would say that combination is critical. So, you know, I'm kind of out of this loop in a way. You know, I teach my students to try to read better, which is what Adam is doing as well, but different material. And I do something that uh, is out of sync with much that goes on in the academy now. I teach them to think about politics mm -hmm. in my English and history courses. I say, this is not knowledge to, to go away. This is to make you think about what it means to be a citizen and how you become a citizen and how you act politically. If you don't do it, you're going to die. I have a course this semester with 11 students who are uh, birthright Americans. Parents are all immigrants, speak other languages. None of them voted in the election. I told them that for that, they deserved a, a, an F in the course. And I really, I don't lecture my students usually, but I really let them have it. So the question of what it means to be an active citizen in these terms is a question that we need to think about ways to make central in our educational system. So that Adam's skills and other people who teach this material, but also those of us who aren't teaching this material should be thinking hard about how in our teaching, because being active thinkers is crucial. And it's crucial to the question of being skeptical. Uh, and, and Dan, again, I agree with that. And one of the problems with skepticism is it becomes universalized as opposed to a, as a way of thinking your way through something. I have a student um, I'm teaching sure. at University of New Haven, and my students are about to do their finals. And their final uh, is they have to give a presentation, um, most of them choosing to give a TED talk or a TED type talk. And they first have to present the ideas to me. We talk about them, then they write an outline. I give them some recommendations, and they write a second outline, and then boom, we're on to the talk. So the biggest school at the University of New Haven is the College of Criminal Justice. It's also where we have the most elite students because it's a very highly regarded program, so students coming from all over the nation uh, to be part of what we call CJ, the Criminal Justice School. And so one of the young women who is a CJ major uh, wants to talk about how the media has distorted people's ideas about the police and how if we all did a little research and did a little reading, we would understand the police better and not have a bad impression of the police. And she goes through her outline and she talks about how the media uh, uh, distorts, that she uses words like distorts. She says, because the media cuts out parts of the story that they don't want you to see. And she goes on and on like that. And I'm thinking, A, I probably mentioned in every class that I'm a journalist, <laughs> mainstream journalist. So probably she's not thinking A, if she's already insulting me in her outline by saying that we manipulate everything, but okay. So my question to her, I went back with her over the outline and I said, how do you know this? Have you done research on this? Because she asserted that a majority of uh, news coverage is anti-police. 
I said, how do you know this? Well, I've heard it. I said, have you done any, you're in college now, have you done any research on this? Well, where would I do that? Well, there are <laughs> studies being done all the time that literally count what type of coverage and all sorts of topics, but certainly about police. Uh, are they positive, are they negative? How many times are they mentioned in the news and then this and that? Uh, and then when she asserted that you know, we could all do better appreciating the police if we did some research and reading, I said, and that's what you need to do before you assert this in your story in the TED Talk that you're gonna give us. And she was completely nonplussed and didn't understand really what I meant and said, but, but I've heard this, I hear this all the time. You're fighting, and this is you know, swimming uh, you know, against the current, you're, just, you're, you're fighting cognitive bias. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in the lizard part of our brain. Once people land on it, this, this piece, they, it, they're very, it's very difficult to dislodge. So and not, not any study, uh, even her own a quantitative analysis of this, will change her uh, in any way unless she starts becoming self-critical mm -hmm. and starts becoming aware that we all have cognitive biases. And you know, that, to me, is where education comes in. Is, is teaching the, that we all have cognitive biases and we need to overcome our cognitive biases by analytical thinking. Um, and and uh, actually, uh, two former CIA officers came up with a curriculum uh, because to, in the CIA, to be an analyst, you can't deploy your cognitive biases in your reports because people die, your policy goes awry, something terrible, uh, come, not that something terrible is uh, happening every, uh, all the time, but so you're trained to fight your cognitive mm -hmm. bias, and you're you're trained to argue with yourself mm -hmm. about why you why you have a position. Then you have to defend your position analytically, and, and I think we in education, you know, and I'm pointing to myself here, don't do enough of that mm -hmm. uh, about about understanding where cognitive bias is. And, and my point I mean, to the student yeah. was, you may do this research and come out with the same opinion, and that's fine but you need to do the research. You need to have uh, particularly the, yeah. in a talk where you're telling us, do research and you'll find out. Yeah, <laughs> okay, so do some on your own. Yeah. But um, it, it, you know, I can't help thinking um, back to you know, Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, right? Um, you are entitled to your own opinions. You're not entitled to your own facts. Today we're entitled to our own facts. Well, our own reality. Yeah. We have, we have all these competing realities and the, the tragedy you know, is that there are, a, you know, as Professor pointed out, there are significant policy issues in play, you know, from climate change, you know, you know, to in income inequality, uh, to quite frankly, hunger, opioid abuse, all these complex problems that have greeted us in the 21st century, and we've retreated, uh, you know, to our caves where we've, you know, project our own shadows on the wall of the cave which have no corresponding link to a reality, so we can't possibly solve these issues. Um, and and that, that, to me, is the apocalypse, mm -hmm. is, is that when we have these competing realities and that can't be reconciled, uh, and so these problems will not be solved. That's the issue. I, I noticed a commercial recently, and I think it was running on MSNBC, which kind of will make you laugh when you hear what it was. It's a commercial for some news source. I think it's an online platform. And the advertisement uh, has consumers saying, until I got, I think it's called Smart News, until I signed up for Smart News, I only used to read news that I already believed in. Until I got Smart News, I t listened to what everybody told me and I believed what they said. And I'm thinking, and you're running this on MSNBC. Okay. <laughs> and it, it, it's, it's, it's interesting about that ad, the narrative of the ad also says, now I get both sides of right. the story, not that I have a right. consensus right. view right. of the story. Right. So it's actually reinforcing cognitive biases right. in its, in its, its marketing. And it's yeah. also instating the idea that every important issue has two sides. Has two sides. What, and the important they, issues never have two sides. They never have two sides, right. absolutely, yeah. But I, there's, there's a, a ground I want to try to walk on for a moment. Uh, I grew up in the Finger Lakes region of upstate New York and a working class farming community and come from a very large Irish Catholic family. Uh, I have no sentimentality about that, I should say, actually. Uh, <laughs> learning to tell by people's uh, breaths what alcohol they had been imbibing was part of my growing up. <laughs> uh, now it's something less or worse. But it's a, a part of the country that has been economically devastated for a very, very long time. Uh, all the factories are gone that sustained the farms because people would work in the factories so they could sustain themselves in small acreage farms. 
uh, multinationals have taken over. It's very, very good land. They've taken over the land. There are now tenant houses, which are devastating to see. Uh, and the manager, because it's usually a manager, has a mansion. Horrible taste, huge thing. Uh, herds of a 1,000 or more cattle, which are ecologically disastrous. Um, it's Trump country because my cousins, I have 21 first cousins, most of whom are still there. Most of my cousins have never made minimum wage in their whole life. And they've watched the world they live in Disintegrate's probably too strong a word, but become unrecognizable in certain important ways. Their politics are not simple. Uh, partly your notion about the way people get an idea in their head and hold on to it is there, for sure. Um, but, but one of my cousins has a transgender child, for instance, still supports Trump. Um, Another has two uh, gay sons that are adopted. I mean, you know, the whole spectrum of the reality of the world we live in. So the, the social attitudes are not present, but fury is present. What has happened? Who's responsible? Uh, this is the only person who promises to do something, even though all of my cousins pro say promise to the most of them. They either get drunk or spit at you. Promise, nobody ever keeps promises, but they believe him. Uh, and the last election cycle has made it stronger. So that's, for me, an issue. How you, how you speak into a world in which people are actually have suffered greatly, have not been recognized, and now have adopted a set of stances which are a serious obstacle actually to their own possible in, improved lives, uh, but are also politically an obstacle. The only place where a Republican congressman, a horrible one, uh, from Syracuse, uh, won substantially, won challenged by a very strong challenger. And it's that vote. Yeah. Cities all went, went, went against this congressman, but the rural part. It's a story all over the country, in a way. Um, so there, I think, there's a, there's a material something which feeds or reflects off what we're talking about. And, and that, too, needs to be, as it were, put in place somehow. Uh, I don't know about where your students are coming from or yours, Diane. You know, we have 60% of our student body are first-time college goers and full financial aid. Mm -hmm. So it's an extraordinarily diverse mm -hmm. population. Them. But 40% come from the richest 5% mm -hmm. of the country. Mm -hmm. So it's also a very, it's an unacknowledged mix even in itself. Mm -hmm. And if you live in a relatively prosperous place, the motive to see more and hear more is not strong. Mm -hmm. Curiosity is not dependably present. Do we have any other comments or questions anybody would like to uh, insert at this point? Please raise your hand if you do. Uh, we haven't talked that much, or at least not explicitly, about the power of money in what happens in media. And uh, Rich, I think you were talking about the golden age of journalism, which was at a time when media outlets were owned by people who believed in journalism. Now they're not, necessarily. Now they're owned by mega corporations that own lots of other types of companies, uh, or they're owned by ideologues, or they're owned by people that have really no interest in journalism, but have an interest in trying to make money. Um, and, and I was recently, um, hearing on the radio about a documentary that's about to come out about Roger Ailes, who of course was the, um, the founder of Fox News. And I thought it was very interesting. The documentary maker asserts in this documentary that President Clinton would never have been impeached except that Roger Ailes found a story that grabbed viewers and made a ton of money. And so they reported it and reported it. It was a drumbeat in the year that Fox News first came on the air. And it not only established Fox News as a big source of news, but it also made them a ton of money and kept the drumbeat going. I wonder if that is true. Oh, I, I absolutely. Uh, and, and certainly in the case of Fox, if we were uh, a nation, as a nation, um, say, like Sweden, just to take you know, a Nordic country, you know, which has a, a, you know, a very profound and um, you know, detailed safety net mm -hmm. and green policies mm -hmm. and whatnot, Fox News would be profoundly progressive because that's where the money is. Mm -hmm. But Ailes understood that he could play into the cognitive biases of folks who had grievances to air. 
It didn't, it didn't matter how or why those grievances emerged, but he knew that he could sell grievance. He could mm -hmm. package it as a message and run it throughout the evening block of opinion shows mm -hmm. um, and do it night after night after night because he just it, he knew he could make money mm -hmm. marinating people by reflecting their grievances mm -hmm. and reflecting their cognitive biases mm -hmm. towards given people, given parties, um, you know, given perspectives on life. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was on uh, Bill O'Reilly's show a number of times, and um, you know, I went toe to toe with him. I, I don't, I have no fear of anybody like that. It's TV for crying out loud. You know? <laughs> I don't think he, I don't think he'd want to reach over and punch me. In. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he'd want to do that, you know. He, but but it, it, you got in there, you saw it. I mean, you, the questions, the way the debate was, debate and quotes, mm -hmm. is, all the stuff mm -hmm. that was framed, it was to that message of the mm -hmm. day. Mm -hmm. And so the, just the way they would use the word professor, what do you think? Okay. You know, they, they sought to denigrate my expertise and my knowledge, my education, because that played well yeah. with his audience. Yes. Yeah. So then I wonder when... Um, companies are taking over media outlets that really are not that interested in journalism, they're interested in their hedge funds take them over, all kind, you know, GE owns uh, CBS or NBC, whatever. Um, what about when a guy like Jeff Bezos buys the Washington Post? I mean, he's got all the money in the world, so he can afford to lose lots of it with the, with the Washington Post, but, you know, President Trump would say he bought the Washington Post because he doesn't like President Trump and he's gonna use the Washington Post as an instrument to beat the president over the head. Well, Jeff Bezos did not fire all the good reporters. Uh, he kept them. He made clear through the editor he chose that he would not interfere in the daily work of the newspaper, nor impose his opinions. Now, whether Trump believes that or not, what does Trump believe, uh, is, is not an issue. I think the issue here is, could we imagine a way of controlling who owns and how much. That is to say, the problem for me with Sinclair, which I think is the monster in the room, mm -hmm. uh, is not that they have some radio stations, not that they have some TV stations, but it's, they're a monopoly mm -hmm. in the making, but already in, in, the, in radio. So there, there should be law that so there were laws that did that. Be, yeah. You know, I grew up as a, 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 as a media student learning about the FCC and how many stations any one company was allowed to own right. and how many markets and, you know, the percentage of audience that they were allowed to control or potentially control. We don't have that anymore, right, Rich? It's, it's been eroded over time yeah. and the argument used by Sinclair Star, um, and Nexstar and others um, is that, well, the Internet makes uh, government regulation of the public airways obsolete. Uh, but that, that's not true. I mean, we know based on the number of people who watch TV over the airwaves, the number of people who don't subscribe to cable, and most importantly, the number of people who aren't on the internet. Right. We tend to think because we live in our own bubbles that everybody's online on their smartphones. No, not everybody is. So they depend on over-the-air broadcasts mm -hmm. to, get, to get their reality, to understand events that are, that are shaping their lives. Um, and I think the FCC has, has overlooked that reality, even though the numbers are there, the quantitative analysis is there. Um, and these corporations like Sinclair and Nexstar are doing what's known in economics as rolling up an industry. Yes. They're just rolling it up and you know, extracting as much profit as they can. And do they really care about the local market? No, no. they care that, that that number every quarter is reached, mm -hmm. and that's their, their profit margin. That has to be reached. And if they don't, the, the you know, general manager gets fired, the news director gets fired, they bring in consultants, the consultants then redo the news, and it's all, it's all part of packaging news as product that's mm -hmm. profitable, not packaging news as a public service. Mm -hmm. Sinclair goes further. Well, they, uh, Sinclair Sin invents Sinclair, the Sinclair, commentary piece. They insist yeah. on a singular line, yeah. and everybody and all their stations must observe it or they're fired, mm -hmm. straight out. So again, I, I would invoke the need for political movements that push hard to reinstate those kinds of controls and in fact, dismantle existing monopolies. That would be the hardest thing of all. Uh, yeah. yeah. And speaking of controls too, related, not exactly, but uh, something we also need to decide is what is you know, Facebook? Are they a media company or a technology company? You know, Facebook forever, and all, all of them, Twitter, have claimed that they are technology companies, though Mark Zuckerberg did 
did have a little, secede, uh, you know, he, he admitted a little bit when he was testifying that maybe we're a media publisher. But you know, like I was, like we talked about, news runs through mm -hmm. Facebook now for many mm -hmm. Americans. Mm -hmm. And we have to decide, you know, are we going to regulate Facebook mm -hmm. as a public utility, mm -hmm. right? Are we gonna put some regulations for them? Um, and if not, because right now they're private companies and you know, they are allowed to do what they want to do. Mm -hmm. And until we decide, do we wanna regulate them or not? You know, part of it is it all comes down to money and Facebook has made a lot of money for the US economy, right? So that's why we've been hands off. But mm -hmm. maybe after all these scandals now, we have to really do, do some soul searching and say, are they a news publication? Because in a lot of ways they are. Mm -hmm. and decide what to do for Absolutely. Them. Mm -hmm. So it's about time for us to wrap this up. So I want to en end this with something less dark and maybe <laughs> hopeful, okay? Because I think a lot of what we talked about has not been terribly hopeful, although it's been very analytical. Um, and I'll start with you, Professor O'Connell, because you told me uh, in a conversation we had, you always have hope. So tell me where there's hope for this. I should define hope. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And then I'll, I'll, get off, right. I'll get off your hook this way, too. Uh, there's a very great uh, French thinker, Simone Weil, uh, who was a woman philosopher, really, uh, who was in the resistance during World War II. She was Jewish. Her family barely escaped Vichy, France. Um, magnificent writer. She died before the war ended. In one of her last pieces of writing, uh, she says it's important that we understand the meaning of hope. And to do this, she makes a list of all the reasons in the world at the end of World War II not ever to hope. And she knew about the Holocaust, which is not yet even a word, but she knew what had happened. And so it's a list, and it's about 24 items. It is so devastating that when I quoted it once in a speech at Amherst, I was criticized by my colleagues for uh, invoking despair. She ends this column, and she says, this is enough to despair. Hope is the virtue you choose when you know the reasons to despair. Otherwise, suicide is inevitable. Hope is life. So if the three of us here were reasonably lively, even I, the ancient one of the three, um, we're not invoking despair because despair stops all action. So you have to believe, even in the face, I mean, we've, we've talked about really complicated, difficult to reach things, but that's to be honest. It's not to say, don't do anything, or we can't do anything. We still live in a democracy. We still have the habits of most Americans which we feel we should have a voice. Uh, and those Americans who don't feel that, the subject of my talk, really, uh, need to be reached out to. Um, and one of the things that can happen, it's very interesting when you get yourself in conversation. My cousins are not easy to talk to these days. Um, but I have some relationship, and we listen, and we talk about what's afoot. Now, do I think I'm going to change their mind? I wouldn't be able to have the conversation if that was my goal. Uh, but moving yourself comes by moving others, not ever in a righteous way. So I live in a town filled with righteousness, which I find utterly disgusting and apolitical. The belief in one's own virtue is another kind of death. Don't have it. Well, I agree with that, I, what he said. <laughs> <laughs> well, Rich, no, what I was going yeah. to ask you is, yeah. you're training young journalists. And what we have portrayed here is somewhat uh, of a dark picture for the future of journalism. What do you tell those young people that you're sending out into the world as journalists? Well, I tell them they're on the wall, that, that it's them that's standing between fascism and democracy, and that they should take particular pride in the fact that they've chosen a career that may not have the financial rewards that the folks in the School of Business are, are looking, looking toward when they graduate. But they're on the wall, and, they have, and it's a, they're pursued a life in public service, and that they should be um, you know, profoundly grateful to their own uh, imagination mm -hmm. that they have decided this life is important and as, as we go through the issues and the complications of this of the 21st century and the tensions that they can play a role in solving these issues um, and and they can uh, because we live in the information age as I mentioned about the battle space it's no longer about how many tanks you have it's how you how you access information to your your wider public so they're ready to go out into rural areas and cover rural uh, uh, stories. Uh, in fact, one student, just to give you a quick example, if you don't mind, Diane, you know, he, 
you know, I told him, I said, just go out and look what's going on in the dairy industry. You know, just go out to a farm. He'd never been to a farm. He never, I said, go talk to the folks who live on the farm. And he did. He's a city kid. Now I can't stop talking about it. Because he went, as the professor said, to people whom he would never think of meeting. Yep. But I said, as a journalist, you have an obligation to do that. Right. And he did. And hopefully, you know, he will use his training to continue to do this, and, and his own spirit, more so than me, his own spirit to go out to areas that are ignored by media and to write their stories mm -hmm. and to have those conversations, as the professor mm -hmm. so eloquently put it. Mm -hmm. Professor Chiara, I, um, I guess I uh, give you the final mm -hmm. word, which is, is there a bright side to this digital age of, of information? Yeah, and I alluded to it before. I mean, no time in human history have we had more access to more information than we do now. I mean, like I said, you could pull out your phone and in a moment find any source of information, quality information, not just the junk we're talking about, you know, with just a few clicks. Uh, you know, and if the old adage is true, you know, uh, information is power, how much power that we all have. So I think with proper training, you know, we can enter that, that golden age of social media. You know, we talk about the golden age of journalism. We're going to enter that golden age of digital media. Uh, we're just going through some growing pains right now. If we do the right things, we'll get to that golden age. I like your optimism. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all for being with us today. Uh, it's been very good having you with us. Thank you, uh, the three of you, for coming and sharing your, you, your time with us. Thank you so much. Very patient.